big year for Chicago. Um, I think Justin Fields, after two years, we know he's talented. He can move. He's got a whip for an arm, but a lot of mistakes, some not his. But there'll be a sense, Dave, that after this year, you either got to jettison, move off him, or lean into him. You've been to practice. What is your takeaway on what you've seen? Well, I, I think the first thing you said, a big year for Chicago. I think the people in Chicago, and I don't know if they'll get it, but it's what I'm preaching. I think this needs to be a reasonable improvement year for Justin Fields. You know, I mean, he, he, can't, he doesn't need to go out and be Aaron Rodgers, okay, when he was at Green Bay. I mean, he needs and to improve 100%, but I think it needs to be reasonable. But I, when I look at Chicago, they have two number one picks next year. Everybody that they signed, free agency, plus the draft picks, there's not a player on their, on their roster that they signed that was older than 26. And I spent about an hour with Ryan Poole, the general manager, up for about a week ago, two weeks ago. And, you know, they, they have purposely built a young football team. And it's not talked about, but I think that, Yes, Justin Fields needs to perform. I think it's the Philadelphia Eagles blueprint. You know, I mean, let's let's all if, if we're all honest with ourselves, me included. Uh, before last season, I wasn't sure if Jalen Hurts could be the guy, and right. the Eagles. I don't think the Eagles thought that either, Colin. And they're sitting there with two number one picks, and they're saying to themselves, "I promise you, if he's not the guy, we're going up to the first pick and get a quarterback." The Bears. I, I don't think it'll happen. No one's talking about it, but they have the draft picks to do something if it doesn't work out. Yeah, the um, listen, I, I, I will say by getting Robert Tanyan, they now have two tight ends, Cole Komet. Um, by getting, I, I'm, I'm not a huge Chase Claypool fan, but I do love DJ Moore. I think Mooney is more than capable. I went and looked at the PFF grades for their offensive line. It's not as bad as, say, the New York Giants. Uh, or the Tennessee Titans last year. It's kind of middle of the pack. I think they found a left tackle last year in the draft. So my takeaway is I don't need Justin Fields to be a playoff quarterback. But I don't think if he struggles, we can blame the personnel, Dave. I, I think the Bears have given him good enough pieces to work with and win 10 games. Is that fair? It's, that's fair. And, and you know what? When I was up there, DJ Moore made three catches that bear receivers haven't made in three years. And the guy that was smiling the most and wasn't the head coach who wasn't the general manager, it was Justin Fields. You know, so they have really connected uh, from the standpoint of a confidence between quarterback and receiver. You mentioned Robert Tunyon. I think he might be the – you talk about a steal in free agency. They had – they – sure, if Claypool comes on, fantastic. If he doesn't, when, when I saw Robert Tunyon, they've flexed him out like they used to do with Tony Gonzalez back in the day, and he can beat safeties one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, he is that type of athletic tight end, or you bring him in tight. So he that's a heck of a signing for the Bears. It truly is. So I, I think they feel real good about their passing game, and uh, you know, and they're going to be committed to running the ball. The whole key, and I was up for – and Luke Getze, you know, the offensive coordinator, he worked for me at Pitt. I got a great – with them and and he said you know we got to take the next step we're going to take the next step we got to be balanced we got to be balanced in this and so there it's um uh, it's exciting but i do agree they do have the weapons what's the typical chicago bear fan reasonable not liquored up if you said would they be disappointed with nine and eight and justin Fields showing improvement yes uh, yes, they, they probably would, but I, I think it's seven, eight win team. I think they're a seven, eight win team at, with Justin Fields showing improvement. I'm concerned about the Bears defense. I'm not concerned about their offense. I mean, their, <laughs> their defense coach, the leading guy soccer for him was Brisker, the strong safety last year. I never heard of that before. <laughs> the guy that got the most sacks on your team is a strong safety. That's scary. No, they added they're going to have – they got three free agents on the defensive line. They drafted two defensive linemen. The Stevenson kid, I'll tell you what, the guy they drafted in the third round out of Miami, okay, Tyreek Stevenson. This yep. kid, when I was at practice, 
he's going to be a starter at corner. And this is big. I was talking to head coach Matt Eberflus, and they run a scheme that's kind of like what we did at Dallas and kind of what, like what Tony Dungy did at Tampa. It's a combination of two with the point being that they have to get pressure with their four guys. That They're always going to be one of the least blitzing defenses in the NFL. So the guy that, that's really important is that nickelback. He's the most important guy in their defense, and that's Kyler Gordon. Last year, Kyler Gordon, Bear fans know this, he played corner. Then they put him at nickel. He was, But now, guess what? He's full-time. You're the nickelback. Don't worry about anything else. We got Jalen Johnson on one side, and we got Tyreek Stevenson, who had – the day I was there, the guy had an interception for a touchdown, knocked down three balls. This guy from Miami, he's – they're going to be a big-time player. That was a great pick for them, and it's going to fit into their defense perfectly. But it's going to come down, can they get any pressure? Uh, you know, I, I don't see it. It's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. Well, the good news, Aaron Rodgers is out of yep. division. Dalvin Cook will be out of division. Uh, Detroit uh, moved off DeAndre Swift. Um I still think they're Detroit. I think we're overvaluing them a little. They didn't make the playoffs. I think they win a couple more games, but it's a winnable division, coach. Minnesota's not going to go 11 and 0 in one score games. That's not happening again. So I don't think I I I mean I I I just think this is the year for Chicago. I think they could be a 10-win team. Um they've got to cut down on mistakes and let's be honest. Justin moves. He's got to stay healthy. I worry about that a little bit. Yeah, I, I like them. I love them in the opener. You know, they they open up with the Packers, Jordan Love right here in Chicago. Wow, that's going to be an exciting – I mean, there's going to be a lot of pressure on them. I like the Bears there, but I, I kind of disagree with one thing. I'm picking Detroit. I like Detroit to win this division. I'll tell you what, they – you know, obviously they, they drafted Gibbs, the running back from Alabama that transferred from Georgia Tech, but they got David Montgomery, who was with the Bears. And this kid's a heck of a football player. So you, they got the rookie Gibbs, the number one pick, and they got David Montgomery, the running back. They that's a, they got the receivers back. You know, they got Marvin Jones. They they got Saint uh, Saint Brown coming back. They drafted this Laporta kid, and I know it was Iowa, yes. but he was not just the number one tight end. He he had the most receptions of any tight end in the Big Ten conference. And this kid is a player now. And no one – I can't get anybody excited, but my guy for Defensive Player of the Year in the Big Ten Conference for the last three years was Jack Campbell. And they drafted him in the first round. A big linebacker. No one's saying Jack Campbell. This guy gets in. He's 6'5". Look at his – anybody's out there that's questioning me, look at the guy's combine times. The guy makes interceptions. He makes sacks. He makes 100-plus tackles every year. He graduated like six years ago. I mean, the guy's broke. <laughs> this guy, I'm telling you, I'm excited. And then who, do, who does Detroit get? They get the branch, the safety from Alabama, who I thought was going to be a second-round pick, or some people had him higher. They get him in a third round. This guy's going to come in and play for them. He's a heck of a player. Talk to Saban about him. I think Detroit did really well in the draft. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm on their bandwagon. I really am. Well, I'll say this, the Vikings and the Bears and the Packers have struggle, struggled to generate a pass rush, and Detroit's offensive line is re it may be the best Lions O-line they've ever had. Yep. So Jared Goff is going to throw from a clean pocket, and I think that's the one thing they have. You know, sometimes, Dave, as you know, it's matchups in your conference. There's yep. no pass rushes. And so Detroit doesn't have much of one either. So their O-line in Detroit is top four maybe top three in the league. So it, it tells you they're going to generate a run game. And you know, when Jared Goff has time to throw, he's great. That's been the issue. He's like Matt Ryan in his prime. When Matt had time to throw, he'd eat you alive. So when Goff was on the run in LA, he struggled. When Whitworth was in his prime and younger, he got him to a Super Bowl. Absolutely. No question. And the guy they got, they got this quarterback from Tennessee, Herndon Hooker. Uh, I talked to some of these quarterback guys that are on this 33rd team. There's some, they liked him. I, I'm not going to say who there's some guys that liked him as well as any quarterback in the draft. They think this guy is special. So add, he, add him to the, the draft picks that uh, Detroit got. They're, they're going to be pretty salty. I think. 
You ever do any home projects, whether you're a renter or you're an owner? Listen, rent or own, there's a lot of stuff that needs fixing. And something my wife and I really believe in, you got to stay current. You don't want to just fix up when you're about to sell. You want to enjoy it. You want to live in the place. Fix it up when you move in. Angie has 220,000 pros available for you to do the job. It's part of their Angie network. The pros in your area have been rated and reviewed by others. So you know when you sign up, the quality of work you're getting. Go to angi.com or download the free Angie mobile app today. Angie can help you get the best cost for your project. Angie, your home for everything home. Um, you know, every time, every year I make picks and my woe pick of this year in the NFL, the surprise pick is I'm taking Miami to win the division. Uh, first, I think Vic Fangio right now is maybe the best defensive coordinator in the sport. They solved, by bringing Jalen Ramsey over, they solved a corner issue. I don't love their offensive line, but if you look at Mike McDaniel's system, it's Kyle Shanahan's system, it has always been better day for quarterbacks in the second year of it. It's pretty complex. I, I look at what Miami put together. I watched them play the Bills three times last year. They beat them once. They could have beaten them a second time with Tua, and Skylar Thompson played them close. And my takeaway was, I I don't feel right now that Buffalo has had a good last five or six months. Stephon Diggs is complaining. Um, they lost one of their safeties. I have questions about McDermott, his rigidity. Leslie Frazier just said, get me out of here, because McDermott wouldn't let him call plays. There's a little bit of coaching tension. I, if two is upright, I saw he put on about 15 pounds. You tell me your thoughts. I think Mike McDaniel in year two with that offense, I've watched Shanahan in Atlanta. I watched them in San Francisco. It's that second year, Dave. I, I think Miami's going to be a handful. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, we'll start with, uh, you know, Adam Ramsey, but the, the best addition they had is Vic Fangio. You know, now in Vic's defense, and I know pretty good, Vic's defense is not a blitzing defense. I mean, you know, when they were there with, with Brian Flores, it was pressure, pressure, pressure. This is not that. So having the extra corner, you know, having Ramsey teamed up with Howard, I mean, that's a great, great combination. Uh, but they're going to have to generate rush up front. To me, Bradley Chubb is the guy. He's, this guy's got to show up. You know, last year they made the big trade for him. They got him there. And I think Vic will be the guy that will be able to push the right buttons to get a big year out of him. But they've got to generate – they're going to have to generate pass rush with the guys up front. That's one point. The other thing that I think has to happen is, you know, Mike McDaniels, you mentioned the Buffalo games, Colin. It really bothered me. They had Skyler Thompson, who you did a third-team quarterback in there, and they threw the ball twice as many times as they ran it. And I'm watching that game – and I remember when I got the Bears job, my, you know, and, and I was out and the, the late Chuck Noll had just stepped down from the Steelers and we were playing golf. And he said, Dave, never forget why you, you, you're a head coach now. Never forget why you're a head coach. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, you got hired because of your defensive expertise. So I'm watching that Dolphin Buffalo game and I'm thinking to myself, Mike McDaniels was the run coordinator, run coordinator at San Francisco. And they aren't running the ball. If they run the football, I'm convinced they will. So the only question I have is, you know, they're going to have to be balanced. And when you got Tua and you got the firepower, you know, Tyreek and, and all the waddle and everybody, it's real tempting to want to get them the ball, big plays, big plays. But I tell you what, uh, this is good. Mike, McD if he wants to win big, He's going to have to be balanced, and he's going to have to continue running the football. I, I, I don't. He's going to show me that he'll do that. I, I'm not convinced he wants to do it. Well, it's interesting. Kyle Shanahan has Debo and George Kittle and Brandon Ayuk and Christian McCaffrey, and he commits to the run despite how, having oh. those options. I mean, when I think of the Niners, I think of a physical run game. I don't yep. even think of passing. <laughs> no, hundred percent. And you know, the other thing with, too with the Tua, you mentioned Tua. And 
I'm not going to blitz him. I'm not going to take a chance of trying to cover Tyra Kill one-on-one. But I'll tell you what, what's going to happen. Tua, in his mind, if you went through the concussion stuff that he went through, or anybody did, that's going to be on your mind, and they're going to be saying, get the ball out quick, right? Don't take any chances. They don't run up. He's not running quarterback read stuff. So put that aside. That's not going to happen. But get the ball out quick. He's going to see man press coverage. I would play him man, and I would lock up those receivers and knowing that the ball is going to come out quick. And so he's going to – and, you know, he makes good decisions, makes good decisions. We're going to find out how – accurate he is he's gonna have to be real accurate this year because i don't think he's gonna get very many wide open easy throws well the other thing with tua is because his injuries are concussion based yep. that you can't bring him back with another concussion for four to six weeks so to your point i think mcdaniel realizes that they'll run it more and it'll be a lot of a lot of what brady ran just get the ball out garoppolo yep. by the way 1001, 1002, let it rip. And, yep. and I also think McDaniels knows his weakness is his offensive front in a division with Buffalo's pass rush, the Jets' pass rush, and Belichick's defensive front. So I, I do think there's a way Miami will play. Run it, quick passing, protect Tua. Because he goes down. You know, they brought Mike White in for the Jets right. for a reason. It was and better it, than uh, I thought, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah he, he was better than I thought. I, uh, uh, yeah, so in their minds, they probably got a good backup, but it's not Tua. So it'll be interesting to see if, my, if McDaniels can do that. June is championship month in sports. NHL playoffs, NBA finals. Now you can watch all this stuff on television, certainly, but there's nothing like live and there's nothing like being there in person. For last minute amazing deals on the best tickets to comedy shows, concerts, and your favorite sport, check out Game Time. Download the Game Time app right now. The redeem code is me, Colin, C-O-L-I-N, $20, $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Go out and have some fun this weekend. Again, download the Game Time app $20 $20 off your first purchase. The redeem code is C O L I N. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed at game time. You're from Pittsburgh, coached the Panthers for years. You've got a lot of friends there still. Uh, I went and the other day, I went and, and sort of burrowed down on the Steelers. There's a couple of things that are interesting. Number one is, they win over the last three years when T.J. Watt plays. They win 75% of their games. And although he was banged up last year, in his history, he doesn't get hurt. And one of the reasons I lean Steelers over Baltimore for the wild card spot is if you take their eight best players, and I include Najee Harris, their tight end, uh, Kenny Pickett, uh, Minka Fitzpatrick, I go uh, Cam Hayward, I go down the line. None of them have an injury history and virtually all of the Ravens best players except tight end Mark Andrews do have a playoff history and I don't know if Tomlin is more measured at practice but the Ravens have been banged up for four years in a row and the Steelers are rarely hurt and I went back and I looked at Pittsburgh's last six games last year I didn't from beginning to end watch all of them Dave because the AFC has so many more compelling teams at the end of last year, Kenny Pickett was pretty good. The defense was great. Kenny Pickett was pretty good. Yep. What are you hearing? Well, I know this for a fact. Last year at this time going into training camp, he was getting the third team work reps. I mean, it was Mitch Trubisky. It was uh, Mason Rudolph. And it was Kenny Pickett. So his practice time was a third. And, you know, I don't think I, – I think they went into that thing. Mike Tomlin said that Mitch Trubisky is a starter, which he did. And so I, I, I look at that and say, you know, that's a lot of time for a rookie not to be getting the reps that he needs. And then the guy that's probably going to be his top receiver – and then what's his name? Got hurt. Uh, Deontay Johnson was hurt, okay. Uh, Pickens, George Pickens, a second-round pick out of Tennessee, 
he's a star. This guy, he it took him, they tell me it took him two or three, you know, a couple weeks into the season before he started getting a feel for the thing. I mean, they were hoping that Claypool, they were hoping that Chase Claypool was the guy. You got to remember, uh, Chase Claypool went from their number one receiver to two to three. And so all of a sudden, now all of a sudden, you're seeing Pickens getting more reps and Deontay Johnson, they're getting him moved. And then they find out how good Fryer moved. You mentioned him, the tight end yeah. from Penn State. Yeah. This kid is a player. He's got phen- yeah. phenomenal him. It wasn't until about that halfway through the season where Pickett's getting enough reps. Pickens is picking up the offense. And, and now they're realizing, hey, we got a tight end too. So I, I think uh, I like Pittsburgh. I mean, their offense, their stars, the guys we're talking about are all like 25 years or younger. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, the, the, the arrow is definitely up for that offense. Yeah. I mean, it's um, did you like Kenny Pickett out of college? I, I've always said he feels very B plus at everything. He's got a good enough arm, good enough size, good enough mobility. Um, I, I don't th- I don't see a lot of special, but I don't see a lot of um, Dave. I don't see any holes. I don't I don't no. see anything that he, he can move left. He throws right. He's mobile. He can take a hit. My takeaway is, you know, there's a little bit of a C.J. Stroud where I'm like, he looks good enough at everything, maybe great at nothing. What did you hear from your pit people about Kenny coming out? Well, I was back there at Pitt when they were practicing and and sitting in there and talking to Pat Narduzzi, the head coach and the offensive coach, and all the intangible things that you mentioned, and then put a layer of toughness. This guy is a street tough kid. And this kid is a competitor. And I think that, uh, you know, you talked about he's got good enough arm strength. He understands the game. He gets the big picture on and on and on. But now you put in that toughness and those those intangible things, they're real. They are real. And, uh, you know, they share the facility back there. Pitt and the Steelers share facilities. So they're in the same building where they're eating and they're on the practice field. One's leaving. The other one's no one had better exposure to Kenny Pickett for his whole career than Mike Tomlin and the Steelers and Kevin Colbert at that time and the whole Steel organization. So they they know what they're getting, and, they're, and I know they are excited. You know, it's interesting. For years, I was told that the Steelers didn't love drafting Pitt kids because they didn't feel – they felt that they would be too loyal to them. And they were a little concerned that they had such access and visibility that they would tend to – overdraft pit players. So they were always very reluctant. That's that's what I was told that if you go look at their history, they were they they had taken some pit players, but they were concerned that they would tend to yeah, overrate it's, them. It's it well it wasn't as much that. And and I was told this by uh by coach Noel. He said they were always reluctant because we were talking about when Tony Dorsett came out, there was rumors he was going to go but there was always rumors, not Tony, in this situation, but if they drafted a pit kid and it didn't work out, they didn't want to have to cut them in their hometown. You know, Mr. Rooney, Art Rooney, who you know the, runs the team right now and owns it, he was behind me a year at Pitt. He's a pit grad. So those ties with Pitt and the Steelers is a lot deeper than just having this, a professional team in the same city. I mean, there are some deep roots between the Roonies and the University of Pittsburgh. Yeah. Well, the Roonies are wonderful people. They've got oh. charities everywhere. Um, so you do the Big Ten as well. And um, listen, Texas, Oklahoma joining the SEC, I think that's a handful. Um, as we go to a 12-team playoff, though, I think the SEC will probably get four teams in. I feel the same way about the Big Ten. You're not going to keep USC, Michigan, Ohio State out of a 12-team tournament if they're all winning 10-11 games. You're going to get them in. We know this about the college basketball tournament. These networks have a little say. <laughs> they, they want their big brands in, right? Not Boise State. Um what is your takeaway, though? Lincoln Riley has put together a hell of a recruiting class this year. They've, they've really got it rolling. I haven't seen this out here since this past weekend since Pete Carroll. Um, is there, in your opinion, a different style play, though, that a UCLA and USC will face in the Big Ten? Is it different there? Uh, absolutely. 
Absolutely. When you took it, you look at the top defenses, uh, you know, and, and I think a lot has to do, they talk about the weather, but I think there's some validity to that. I mean, it's going to start snowing here in November. You know, I mean, you're going to play in snow the month of December here. So, you know, um, UCLA and USC are going to have to deal with that uh, on a yearly basis. And, um, you know, not that they can't, you know, not that they can't or they won't, but it is a factor. And I think the biggest thing, and I'm doing Big Ten again, I just, you know, for I'm going to do it for a couple more years now uh, coming up. So I was just down there. I did some draft. They did draft shows this year, which they haven't done in a while. And so talking to those people, the biggest hurdle that they're struggling with right now is timing of the games and scheduling. And you have to remember, everybody just wants to talk football. But when you talk Big Ten Conference, adding UCLA and USC, you're talking about all sports, men's and women's. And uh, that's the biggest hurdle. I know the Big Ten is talking about, because they talked to me about having like two game day shows in the studio. And it was always one in the morning and then they were done at, you know, seven, eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night. Now these games, West Coast here, they're going to have to be on the air probably till 12, one o'clock in the morning. And they haven't finalized it yet. You know, the Big Ten's got a brand new commissioner, Tony Petito. Tony Petiti, I'm sorry, took over. Uh, and uh, I got to know to Tony because he uh, he was one of the guys that got me. I'm part of the 33rd team, which is an NFL website that does a lot of NFL stuff. And Tony yeah. was one of the guys that put it together with Bill Parcells. So Tony, um, he, he that's his biggest one of his biggest challenges right now is this whole scheduling thing. How's it going to work out? I wonder if you can't put a small satellite Big Ten office out west, so they'll be up at. 8 30 to 9 30 out west you put a couple of guys out west guys on saturday night <laughs> i mean let's be honest so many of the games it's good for recruiting i mean listen if i was michigan ohio state purdue i would recruit the hell out of california i mean it, yeah. it just opened up a gateway out here did it not wouldn't you oh, yeah. if you were if you were coaching at michigan state tomorrow wouldn't you want to get six to eight players from California annually? Would you send a rec would you actually have one of your assistants live out here? What would you do? I, I'm not live out there, but I would definitely recruit it. I mean, now, you know, I don't know if you're if the lower tier schools are gonna be able to do much. I wouldn't I wouldn't waste time or money on that end, but definitely the schools you mentioned, the Penn States and the Ohio States and Michigans, uh, you know, Wisconsin. I mean, if they if they want to do that, uh I think they could go out there and with every game being on TV and the big 10 network, it's not an issue of a young player nowadays with his parents and his relatives and his high school coaches and his friends not having an opportunity to see him play. That's not the case.